I were to go back, I would have taken more risks. Everything is scary. Everything new is scary. The idea of moving to another city, taking a new job, all of that is so scary and can be very overwhelming because what ends up happening is you always survive. You always make it. It always works out some way. If you can just sit in the discomfort and know that like, I've overcome this before. I think a lot of people's sadness and um, just feelings and fears come from not seeing a solution to the problem in their mind. Spend more time thinking of how it could go right than how it could go wrong. I would have just taken more risks. I would have moved to New York sooner. I would have went for things a lot faster. I wouldn't have been as shy, as timid. Um, I would have really went for it. Welcome to Growth Untold, the podcast where we dive into thoughtful conversations and insightful discussions with world-class people, all with the aim of inspiring, educating, and empowering our listeners. We are thrilled to have you here with us on this exciting journey to explore the diverse stories and the ideas that have the power to shape the world for the better. Welcome to Growth Untold, the podcast. Today we're diving deep with someone whose talent knows no bounds, who's been capturing hearts with her singing since her teenage years. Her natural charisma burst onto the international stage when she was a co-host on BET, redefining her not only as a musical artist, but also a magnetic TV personality. A force in music, television, and business. Welcome the incredibly talented Keisha Shante to Growth Untold. Okay. Keisha Shante. Keisha Shante, yes. welcome Keisha to the Shante. show. Period. I love that intro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> welcome. That's so sweet. Hi, love thank it. you. You look as beautiful as ever. Thank you. And the style, I gotta say. Your whole fit, your shoes, thank your you. purse, no, your chilling. rings. I no, love it. I'm it's on point. Chilling, you know? on point. I'm like one step away from being a full-fledged rapper at this point, but like, <laughs> I almost put my chain on. I was like, girl... Put it away. <laughs> no, you look great. You look classy. Classy, you. classy rapper. Thank you. you. Thank you. Classy rapper. Well, welcome. Um, <laughs> we usually like to start this off by uh, asking you, our guests about their childhood. Yes. Um, and you were in the public eye since you were young, very young. Yeah. But, you know, not a child child. So take us back to to your days before you became, you know, a prominent musician in Toronto? Yeah. Um, well, my dad and his family are all from Trinidad. They're all immigrants. What? They came to Canada. You didn't tell me this. Alex is Trinidadian. I didn't oh, know are this. You? Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay, cool. What? Okay, Port of Spain. Where? Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> Most of them were Arima, Arima, Trinidad and Tobago, and around oh. Tuna Puna. Oh, cool. But, uh, wow. Isn't this cool? Because I grew up with him. So his Trinidadian roots. culture, you know, roots. Wow. Dope. Yeah. yeah. That's like, insane. It was, it was really okay. cool. We were all in Ottawa. And yeah. obviously Ottawa didn't have like a huge community of, of black people there. Um, my mom, also an immigrant from Portugal. She's Portuguese and Puerto Rican. So, and I was an only child. And my parents were together up until I was about six. So the house was generally filled with a lot of music and silence. It was either music or silence. Um, I was often in my room playing with toys, coloring, using my imagination. And my mom would follow me around with the camera every day, film something of me. Like this is like this is before iPhones was a thing. Yeah. So it was like this. Yeah. Like you're doing great, sweetie, like all day. <laughs> so I was constantly performing for her. And then I ended up being in the back of her car and her friend was in the car with her and they were playing Tupac and I knew all the words to Dear Mama, which is one of the only songs I was allowed to really listen to uh, with her anyway. My dad played like Too Short and Snoop Dogg. God bless him. But um, my mom was like, wow, you know all the words. And then her friend was like, there's Black History Month. She could perform. My mom's like, she's six. I wanted to do it. And that was the start of me realizing I wanted to be a performer. Wow. So I ended up getting a standing ovation at six years old doing Dear Mama by Tupac Shakur. And this was natural what? singing. Like you didn't have lessons? or No. Or did you? Well, les lessons with my mom. I've mm -hmm. never had lessons. It was more my mom. My mom, my grandfather was a, a really great uh, songwriter and storyteller in Portugal. Oh, wow. In Portuguese. He didn't really speak English too well. My mom was in a band when she was young. So, and my dad, like, loved to, you know, break dance. My grandfather in Ottawa had, like, one of the only Caribbean restaurants. And there was a club of it. Like, everybody in my family is just musical entertainment yeah. type people. Music everywhere. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, no, I just love performing. It was just, it's like, there's something about 
seeing people like want to dance and smile and see like joy that you bring them like that is like contagious. So yeah, of course I, yeah. I've been, I was thinking this the other day cause I'm on a big, um, podcast slash like YouTube video thing when I work out, like I'm, I'm, I'm always trying to learn. I'm like, Oh, I got to learn about crypto or I got to learn about this while I'm working <laughs> out. And I was thinking the other day, I'm like, man, I miss listening to music and just mm. like jamming out. Even when I'm working out, it just gives you this energy. And then I did a session where I was just yeah. listening to music. I was like, my workout was way better. Oh my goodness. Way better. I, I was... can't even, I can't even work out with the right music. Like the, so I have this trainer in LA and it's like this really great facility. Every time I walk in, the trainers, some of them are excited. Some of them are like, ah, shit, she's going to change the music. Because everyone's stuck listening to what I... And when I tell you it's gangster shit, yeah. I cannot do any... Am I allowed to swear? Sorry. Yeah, I, yeah, swear. Of course. Yeah. I can't even... Fu- I need like trap. So what do you listen? What like, are you listening dope to? Like, boy. Like, I need to feel like I'm going to go to the championship game or else I'm not lifting anything. <laughs> like, at all. And you know what? Everyone appreciates it when I get there, except yeah. a few that were listening to Bad Bunny and they were like, bye, Bunny, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> no, his name's Ricky. I'm like, no more, Ricky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to hear 21 Savage. And he's yeah. like, ah. Oh. Uh, LA is addicted, <laughs> uh, obsessed with Bad Bunny. Makes sense. Loves him. But, but that makes sense. So <laughs> you are in Ottawa. And you find your love of music. Yes. When do you make it out to Toronto? Is it a decision you make because of music or just because most people in Canada move to Toronto? What, how, did, you know, how did that work? It's weird. Like, I don't remember Ottawa too, too much. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because my career was such a whirlwind at 13 that I blacked out a lot of memories. I still haven't really yeah. figured that out. But um, I just performed anywhere that would let me. And we constantly filmed it. And we filmed it mainly to go home and dissect it. And I was flat here and this note wasn't good and I got a better, you know, my mom is very, um, she's got an ear, so she's critical and it was a stage mom thing that we used to do, Mm. me and her. Um, But I appreciated it because you need that, you need that criticism, you need that feedback. Um, And it was a, a DJ, it was a friend of a friend, DJ, wanted me to do a little song thing for his mixtape saw my performance on a video that got played and um, I sang for him and then somebody from a record label was like I'm gonna be in town do you have any new talent he recommended me to the A&R it was literally like boop 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 and uh, the A&R called me one day on my home phone (laughs) and I remember playing a video game on my computer (laughs) because I was like 12 and he asked for me to sing on the phone for him and I did and uh, then he's like, would you like to come to Toronto and meet, uh, at the time it was BMG Canada, which is Sony, uh, meet the team and uh, perform for them in person. I was like, yes, I would love to. Mom came home. I'm like, mom, guess who I just spoke to? She thought I was tripping. But, um, <laughs> she thought you were like some crazy 12-year-old. <laughs> like, what, girl, like, what? <laughs> I was like, no, so so call me. She's like, girl, whatever. Um, but I did go and I performed and um, they signed me, but they signed me to a one song deal. So I had to prove myself. Like a single deal. A single deal, yeah. Yeah. So um, I immediately was... And what was that? What did you end up doing for your single? It was supposed to be just unpredictable. Okay. And um, they just said one song, but there were people rooting for me in the building. There were some people that were like, she's cute and she's talented, but she's 12. Like, what are we going to do with that? But the others were like, no... We see something in her, just give her a chance. So we got in the studio and we actually made Shook and Unpredictable, my first two singles. And they sent out Shook as a tester. Okay. Kind of unbeknownst to the like label and um, had me go with the street team to like the radio stations, you know, missing school, some nighttime driving around and, and pulling up being like, hey, can you play my song? And like in the car, they'd come to the window and I'm like, hi. You know, it's like, didn't know what I was doing. It was just hustling, okay? Yeah, it was yeah. hustling. And they were started to add it to the traffic show and wow. the morning show. And then Shook ended up being, like, I think number three in the country or something like that. Wow. Like, really quickly. And then it was a perfect way to set up Unpredictable as a release, like, an official yeah. release. And then Unpredictable was, like, certified gold, which at the time wow. was really cool. Um, it went number one. We had a number one video, I think, too. Like, wow. we were, like, doing things. And then I ended up getting nominated um, for Juno, yeah. our Canadian Grammy. So, yeah. Um, a lot That's of that amazing. At we like hustled. 13, 14. Yeah, like t- yeah, I was 12 when I signed that Jeez. and I was still expected to get A's in school 
So yeah. when I say definition of A1, okay, we had A's in school, and number one's on the radio, okay? A girl wow, was working. Yeah. Okay? Like we were killing she it. She was earning her keep. 12 yeah. and 13, what were we doing in elementary school? We're trying to just... Uh, we always get this wrong. What is 12, 13 in grades? Yes, what, what is that? Grade three? It's always, grade um, it's the grade plus five is usually your age, is what they say. So seventh grade? I was trying to get played... I was, I was oh, yeah, trying, trying to get to Mr. Play, Brown to play, play me. us on the basketball team. Yeah, on the oh. basketball court. <laughs> we were bench warmers. That's what I was trying to do. That's, yeah. that's what I was focusing Everybody on. hit puberty. Oh, and I played Peter Pan. You played Peter in Pan? In elementary school. Oh. Uh, but I, I wasn't... I had the A's, not the ones. I had any number one hits. So <laughs> That's so cute. Wait, yeah. you guys were in school together? Yeah, we, yeah, grew, up yeah, together. we grew up together. Adorable. Yeah. We grew up together. We did. Yeah, I've known Alex for a long, long time. Long time. But and like, cool. but I want to go back to your point. You were in the public eye at age 12, age 13. Yeah. How did that feel? Like you were from just from a tender age, like yeah. a child celebrity. Well, Shantae's my middle name. So everybody in school didn't know me as that. And um, that's before like your picture would go out. No one really like knew what you looked like. Right. No one knew what I looked like until Unpredictable, the music video dropped, and it was playing like crazy on much music. Especially... It's not like Spotify, where now the whole music video is playing with the song. Yeah, it was a different time, but I remember trying to still be in school and be under the radar. I didn't really want to tell anybody. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in the cafeteria and a girl coming up to me this is your song, right? And like played it. I think it was on like some sort of thing she had and she played it and I was so mortified. I don't know why I was so embarrassed. Wow. But it, I think I, I had a lot of social anxiety at that time. You're an only child. So of course, you know, I'm not well socialized. Right. And then you add this layer of like people looking at you. It's very uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, it's a lot. A lot of people think that um, fame is like this thing to aspire to and that it's that's like, what they think that's what they think but it's actually something that in a lot of people me too it causes a lot of anxiety and so and, much and you don't really know how to deal with it and like when we were growing up it'd be like i want to be a famous actor like my yeah you know alex just told this story but my email yeah. one time was like famous actor forever <laughs> so it never expired but yeah but <laughs> that was it so Straight but you up. think you want to be famous yeah but it's actually one of i think the like cons that that comes with yeah. achieving success and doing what you love yeah i think yeah. i would agree i think you know fame can definitely bring you opportunity you're in people's eyeballs you know i think you have to be very careful about accessibility versus visibility i think that's a really important thing but a lot of the social media stars we see they're chasing fame and sadly you kind of have to focus on earning and keeping enough income to provide security because being famous without money to have security puts you in a lot of really scary positions. Amen to that. And I think sometimes, you know, they're like, I just want to be famous. I don't want everyone to know me. And it's like, yeah, but you don't, it's nice to go out and people, oh, I love your music. It, it's such a great feeling. Like I love people that come up to me and support me. But then you get other people that look at you and now they're preying on you and they're watching you. And we've seen a lot of amazing people die because of stuff. I don't, I'm not trying to be dramatic, but it's it's true. No, it's Fame can true. be very scary. There's it's, two sides of it. It's true. I, I, I want to take this chance to talk to you about this because I'm sure you experienced it. But I, I always talk about this weird spot where you achieve fame before you achieve the stuff that comes with fame, like right. the money and um, you know being able to afford things like security yeah. and being able to separate yourself from sticky situations. Mm -hmm. Sometimes fame happens, but you can't afford any of the stuff that you need to deal with fame. And then it causes a lot of stress because yes. you're like, I'm not, re I don't have the tools to deal with this. Yeah. Did you feel that growing up when you um, achieved that? Or were you too young to really comprehend it? I think I was more so feeling isolated and feeling more of a loner with the career and feeling I didn't understand anxiety at the time, but my anxiety was out of control and I didn't and it would come out in different ways. Um, in terms of money, I don't think I really had a too much perception of money. I just knew that I had money. That was all I knew. I knew it was like, wait, you can't tell me I can't have that. Like as a 13 year old, my mom and dad, like I could buy that. I got it. Don't I? Like it was like that or like, <laughs> no, I want to have ice cream before dinner. Like 
I can now. Or like, you know, J-Lo said she loved La Mer and La Mer was like such an expensive cream. It still is, but at the time really expensive. And I was like, I want to put this on my body because I can. Like I was like in that type of, you know, right, little bratty right, kid with money. Yeah. You don't give a 13 year old money. Um, but <laughs> so you were I just, starting to understand it. You were like, I think I, I just yeah. realized that my mom couldn't tell me what to do anymore. Right. That's what was clicking in my head. Like, wait a damn minute. Like, I don't think you could tell me that anymore. But no, she'd still be my ass. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think what I realized, like I had some, I did have some weird situations. I still to this day won't go anywhere without security. In LA, it's a little different. I can move and shake a little differently. Um, well, everybody drives anyway, everywhere in their yeah. car. And, and, you know, yeah, it's it's kind of set up. I think that's why famous rich people like living in LA. It's kind of set up. It's set up bit, yeah. a certain way. And, and in Toronto, I'm not saying they like run up on me, but what happens is if I go to a restaurant, you know, even if I'm, unassuming you walk in say there's 30 people in the restaurant and you're unassuming you sit down it takes one person to be like isn't that that's all it takes as soon as one person goes isn't oh, yeah. that it's over it's phones out it's everything it's- they tell one person and then another person and then you're sitting there minding your business not and then you could feel the room start to shift and then the servers will come over and then like the chef will come over and be like oh we're very excited and that's fine i I, I embrace all of it, but if you struggle with anxiety, it you're sitting there and you're feeling this start to happen, um, and yeah. you never know. And then sometimes you get like I've had situations where I've had people in my backyard, like wow. coming down for breakfast, sitting down and they're kids like in my, yeah, <laughs> in my yeah. backyard. Yeah. I've had people like run up on me and people get my number before. I've had like. I've been. I've had some interesting. <laughs> yeah, it feels like the world is closing in on you a little Especially bit. Especially when you're young. Because you lose. Uh, even now, it happens to me. But I, listen, I haven't dealt with it for you know however many years you have. So for me, it's it's still kind of a new thing. Right. Sometimes. Oh, okay, yeah. Where you know you're kind of like you, you feel the shift, like you said. Yes. And it's a lot because then you're like you like freeze almost it's like what what am i supposed to do like oh i shouldn't do this i shouldn't and you start overthinking everything because you're like everybody's looking at me this is weird <laughs> sometimes you just want to be left alone you know yeah especially if you're like having a drink or whatever like oh. you just want to be left alone i couldn't go anywhere i couldn't go to the mall i couldn't go to the movie theater school was really weird um so i had to get homeschooled um so so tell me yeah. so tell me about that you're so you're 13 this happens and then you know i think when would you say things like really took off for you and you started to feel like, all right, I'm hitting up, I'm hitting a peak or not a peak, but you know what I mean? Like a climax. Yeah. Kind of, of... I felt, I think I felt it the most when, when I was about 16 years old, I was now moving out of school. Um, my songs were now getting on BT, which at the time was a huge deal because our Canadian artists weren't getting on 106 and Park. We weren't getting U.S. plays and stuff like that. So, you know, 106 and Park and BT, and it was and Bad Boy was a song, and everyone thought I was signed to Diddy because Bad Boy Records it was that you know the attachment, right. and then um, you know doing a song with Foxy Brown. So that was like the U.S. alignment was starting to happen. Um, you know, winning a Juno at the time. And I was the youngest, I think, at the time. So the the, the energy was coming, you yeah. know, and I was getting a lot of cool offers and, you know, pitches to do different brand deals and acting things. And, you know, maybe we moved to L.A. Maybe we moved to New York. That's when things started to move. Um, yeah. And it was a, it was a wild time. I it's still so there's so many blacked out parts. I don't. Yeah. Maybe I need to talk to my therapist. <laughs> Be like, hey, girl, I know we did a lot of work, but there's some key moments. I can't seem to answer in interviews because I don't remember. Like, it was a whirlwind. I don't yeah. remember it. I was busy every day. And then when does it slow down? It slowed down when, you know what? I got into a relationship. So I dated a little bit in my teens, but not really. I wasn't really allowed to. I was. It was really strict. Everybody was on me. So I wasn't allowed to, like drink and party and that whole child star going wrong and getting arrested and all that stuff that stuff didn't happen to me in my teenage my teenage years i was just like an angel an angel was i didn't even have a boyfriend i mean i I mean i kind of did but not really 21 is when it really shifted for me so i started dating um an athlete a well-known hockey player and um very canadian of you very Canadian of me. Uh, his name was Ray, Ray Emery. And uh, when we started dating, I remember we were on like our first date and he asked me a question and I answered it very immediate trained. 
like he'd be like, so, you know, what do you like to do for fun? Like, you know, on a date, you know, I don't yeah, know, yeah, I'm 20, yeah. I, but I'm not, I don't know how to date at the time, right? I'm like new to it. He's like, you know, what do you like to do for fun? And I was like, you know, I'm really excited about my album right now. And like, <laughs> and he literally looked at me and was like, please don't do that. Whatever that was, like, right. I want to know who you are. And that was the first time I realized I didn't really know who I was either. Wow. And he started to uncover the anxiety that I had, and I wasn't well socialized. I'd be put in a lot of social situations, especially with hockey wives, because, you know, every team you'd play for, there's a group of 30 new women you'd meet. You're right. And I was so uncomfortable in those rooms, I didn't even know how to carry a conversation. So he kind of taught me that. He'd say things like, you know, listening is a superpower. Like, if you're nervous, you don't have to speak just to speak to fill the room. Just listen. Like, oh, ask wow. people about themselves. You're naturally, like, curious. Just ask. Like, And that started to, like, shift for me. Wow. So 21 was more my self-discovery He sounds year. like he was a great, it was a great relationship, by the way, for the most part. There was, was, there was a lot of highs and a lot of lows. Okay, okay. The highs were right. highing, though. <laughs> you know, he was incredible for, there was a lot of things right. that he taught me that was incredible. But he really helped me through that. And now I'm like, I talk to everybody. I'm like, hey, girl, random strangers. That's cute. Girl, I'll be walking around like, where you come from? Waiters. I'm like, where do you live? I'm nuts. Like, yeah, yeah. I talk to everyone. I'm so comfortable now. I finally have conquered my anxiety. Um, but yeah, 21 is when I would say it got a little slow. And then all of a sudden, TV hosting started like two. And right. I, that was completely out of left field. Right, right. So when did that start? We wanted to talk about that. I know you had specific questions about that. So I'll let you talk, Alex. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, Alex, where you been at? I don't yeah, know. Man. I'm just, I'm just enjoying conversation. this conversation. Are you watching us over here playing ping pong? <laughs> just call the me hell? out. Just call me out, guys. <laughs> Can you zoom in, Randy? Get in the game, man. What's he doing? <laughs> <laughs> so walk us through that transition. You went from like just like massive star. You were growing up in like different cities like Brampton, Ottawa, Toronto, <laughs> like everywhere. That sounds so fun. Um, <laughs> right? You were ping ponging. I was ping ponging. Yeah. You know, the teen years was really like I didn't have much of a life. I was, you know, doing a tour across Canada. I've toured every nook and cranny of this country, mm -hmm. like Lloyd Minster, like every the smallest places. To the big, like, I didn't miss a spot, yeah. okay? And I did it, like, two, three times over. And then I was doing U.S. tours, and then I did, um, like, Japan. I did that, like, three times. I've had a, It was a lot of fun, so I was always working. 21 is when I became kind of like a housewife. It was unexpected. I was preparing an album. He was doing really well in his career, and um, he ended up in Chicago and Philly and Anaheim, so I went with him. And that lasted. It was fun. So you guys were like mm -hmm. living together and, and yeah. moving around together. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. But then I was bored as hell. <laughs> yeah, we were at little like hockey wives. By the way, you look twenty one now. So yeah. I, don't even, I don't even know. Okay, and I haven't done anything to my face. Okay? I know. You it's look just great. skincare. What? Oh my god. <laughs> we were talking about yes. twenty one and you traveling around 21. to all these places and you were house hockey wifing, house wifing. Yeah, I was house wifing. And you got bored. Bored as shit. <laughs> Bored as shit. And you know what? So when I met him, he had um, a, a hip disease and they said that he'd never walk again. Oh, so his hockey career was pretty much, as far as I knew it when I met him, it was done. And um, I had watched him go from wheelchair to crutches to walking to I'm going to maybe play a little bit or try to get on skates. And I we all thought, you know, it wasn't going to happen. And then, and then it did. Wow. And it created this bond with us but it also created almost a codependence so you know I want I also wanted to see him thrive in his career so I was kind of taking the back seat to support him and I mean what he went through physically and mentally was excruciating so I was so happy to be there um, but it did get to a point where he was like make you know breaking records and they were on their way to the Stanley Cup and they ended up winning and during that time he's like I just need you to be home and consistent not flying all over the place. And I've been working again since I was 13. Never had quiet time to not do anything. So he's like, just try it. Just, you know, have some fun. Like, go to the spa. Go work out. Don't worry about anything. And I'm like, okay, like, let me try. I ended up in therapy so quick. Yeah. <laughs> we were, girls were arguing about the dumbest shit. And I was like, no, this is way too basic. Like, I need, I need to do something. And then... Yeah. Oddly enough, I you know an opportunity came to host a show on BT, 
and some friends. And oddly enough, so the, the president of BET was one of my mentors. He became a mentor because he came to an award show and I, I had won. I was 15 years old. And he was like, you're young and talented and you're from Canada and I'm from New York. Like, I'd love to have you know meetings, come meet our team and stuff. And he was, you know, meeting my mom and he was just an awesome person to have. But he kind of nudged me in that direction. So I auditioned, didn't know it was 106 in Park, and they got thrown on randomly with Terrence J. Roxy wasn't there that day. I was in Turks and Caicos with my boo thing, <laughs> minding my business on a jet ski, <laughs> left my phone in the locker, no care in the world. Yeah. Got to the locker, taking off the thing or whatever from the jet ski ride, looked at my phone, and it was like, can you be in New York tomorrow? Host 106 in Park with Terrence J. And I was wow. like... Like, start the car. Like, that was the energy. <laughs> like, fire up the plane, folks. We're out of here. And, uh, yeah, I flew in and I, I did an episode with Terrence J. I had never done that and before. Was, what, was your hubby pissed? Living. Yeah, yeah, Mad imagine. as hell. Like, He's that like, was. What? Oh, my God. No, that was a fight. That was a full-fledged argument. But, no, I was like, I have to go. This is iconic. This yeah. is just to be on 106 Susan Park as an artist is amazing. But to do it in that host kind of way. And I did not know what to expect. It is insane over there. The audience is loud and it's full of energy. There's a DJ. It's live. There's a teleprompter. I have some people talking in my ear. I don't know what to expect. And uh, it ended up testing really well. Yeah. And um, they came back and, and started to make an offer to me. And were you still working on that album that you said you were working on? Or, I was, or had you kind of just let that go? So I had dropped uh, my third album. Table Dancer like went number one in Japan. Like I, I toured Japan a bunch of times. I was you know traveling across Freaking Canada. I love Japan. Can we talk t oh, talk about Japan for a minute? Everything freaking, fits me. Yeah, I freaking <laughs> love Japan. Japan is amazing. It's fun. Especially love to a there. place that you know you want to go. Like you're like, yeah. Yeah. So I'll go to Japan. But I love it there. And they know, like, they knew the words to every song. Didn't, I don't know if they understood, but then the stores were really cool because everything fits me. But also, they play a lot of hip hop, mm -hmm. but explicit. Right. And I'm like, do y'all know he said he yeah. gonna shoot so-and-so? <laughs> and Lil Tay-Tay died? Y'all know that? And I'm like, okay, I guess we don't know that. But they're like, oh. They're jamming. Uh, yeah. No clue. Yeah, they love it. Uh, <laughs> uh, Japan was... Aladdin's number third best performing country ah. in the box office. It made like over a hundred million dollars just in Japan. Period. So yeah, th they know culture. Like they like feel it. Oh, you know, they amazing. Know it. Like, amazing. I love. I love oh, I love Japan. Okay. One of my favorite places. Can we go back for a second and talk about? Because before we go into to hosting, I want to talk about just you paving the way for R and B. Oh, Canada. thank no, you. We'll talk about that for a second okay. because. Because it was super seldom that artists in Toronto were making their way on the scene. Yeah. Uh, like when you were when you were coming out. Like it, now we got Bieber, we got Daniel Caesar, we got the so Weekend. So much. We got so much talent coming out of here. And but it didn't used to be like it that. It was yeah. not like that. But you were one of those people that paved the way, right? Thank you, you. Honestly, you and Drake are, I would say, up there, and people who are who are you know like biracial and, and people mm -hmm. who have like paved the way in the music industry. Can you speak a little bit? about that experience because you're kind of like you paved the path thank you yeah right? canadian legend for thank sure. you thank you um i think at the time it was very it was very isolating because I, I wanted to make authentic r&b music to me i didn't want to be forced to make overly sexy music i wanted to make songs that i was writing at 14 15 where'd my bad boy go does he love me i met him at the parking lot like all that stuff was authentic and i was happy that my label supported that but those were the discussions like there were no radio stations that were really playing R&B. It was really DJ culture that would, you know, weave it into the traffic show and the morning show. So we relied on them a lot um, and a lot of hustling like college radio. I would go to everywhere you can think just to be like play my music. And um, it was a weird time because there was no one I could talk to. I had really no one. Um, only people that were really doing it were older than me. So it was like Cardi, um, Julie Black, like uh, Baby Blue Sound Crew. You know, they were doing it, but but not the same as me. We're, we're still right. separate in a way, right? Yeah. Um, R&B is international now and everybody yes. listens to it. But back then, that wasn't the case. It was just popular within like, I, I feel like within visibly ethnic, like, you know, ethnically diverse groups yeah. of people. Like yeah. my... My friends grew up listening to R and B, but when I went to school, my white friends did not listen to R and B. That wasn't a thing. Yeah, but it was. Now it's different. Yeah, now it's different, and it was really hard because stateside, 
they're like, what do you know about R&B? Don't you guys live in igloos? Like, that's what it was like then. Like, 2004, 2005, I would go and meet every single record label president in the U.S., and they would see the stats, they'd see the sales, they'd see the accolades, and they'd be like, okay, she's moving and shaking, but what does that really mean for us? So we had to almost play up strategically that I wasn't Canadian. Right. And I got lucky in a lot of ways because my like half my childhood was pretty much spent in Georgia with my grandparents. My Trinidadian grandparents lived in Georgia from the time I was six to, I want to say, 14. So being there for months at a time was my first real exposure to like black culture in that way. Obviously, my Trinidadian family, the Caribbean roots. I mean, two twos like what? what are you talking about? Like, I know all of that stuff. But. Georgia was different. Being in Georgia was like Southern hospitality, like black history, you know, everything from cornbread and grits to, you know, walking down the train tracks to get to tumbleweed going by. Like it's a whole different experience over there. But it made me so proud to be black. It changed my whole perspective on on what I, I was. So I think just, you know, going to the States, going into those meetings, having that background, I don't always sound very Canadian. Right. So that helped me in a lot of ways because sometimes people are like, are you Canadian? I can't tell. So that was part of it. Um, But yeah, it was a lot of doors we had to knock on and walls we had to break down just to get in the room. And it was just a different time. So many of the acts now that are successful, I remember when they were up and coming and I was, you know, doing it and they were asking me, hey, can I get a studio with you? Can I play you these beats? Can I write a song for you? And do you have any advice? And there was, I wanted to pass it on as much as I can. So now I feel, I do feel genuinely proud of seeing Toronto and Canada as a whole doing well internationally. And there's so many people that I see and I'm like, I remember when we had those talks and you were feeling like it wasn't going to happen for you. And I connected you with this person or I asked you to go meet that. You know, I felt like, I did feel responsible at the time because I felt so alone. I didn't want anyone else to feel alone. So wherever I could bring opportunities and make connections, I was like, here you go. I was trying to pass on as much as I could. You should. Yeah, you should. It was fun, though. You should be proud of that. You definitely opened the door, I think, for that whole wave of of musical musician artists you know coming out of toronto especially in the r&b scene yeah you were definitely at the forefront of that thank you i'll take it people didn't know it yet like at the time but you were definitely at the forefront of that thank you thank you yeah and and now there's this whole like uh, burst of new people coming to the scene like what do you think is feeding into that there's like a huge growth engine in toronto like a massive talent pool. Yeah. And like Mina and I were trying to talk about it beforehand. Like what is contributing to everybody coming from Toronto, right? Yeah, I mean, I, for me, it's Drake. Like, period. I really think it's Drake. Um, it's Drake, the weekend, but I mean, Drake, you know. <laughs> it's still Drake yeah. at the yeah, end of the day. Yeah. Um, music in, a, in the States, R&B and hip hop, they looked at Canadian artists as not authentic to the culture. And... Drake really figured out how to navigate that space in the U.S. and having the cosigns, the the, the Lil Wayne cosign was a really big deal. And having that and him really putting in that work made Toronto more of a thing. When you make it, when you make a city cool in hip hop, it's cool. You know, right. he made that happen. And um, once he opened those doors and the, you know, the weekends and the party next door and even Bieber in the, on the pop side, those little moves all together create a huge wave and now everywhere I go they get people get excited I used to say I was from Toronto and people were like what now they're like you from Toronto well they say Toronto yeah yeah Toronto oh, yeah. I know I'm, I'm like scratching Toronto na- scratching nails in the chalkboard eh? oh kill me now <laughs> I'm like uh-huh you never been huh <laughs> well our tourism would love to see you come in August and like- <laughs> and, and, and what is your connection to Drake because there's a lot of stuff out there about you and Drake and, yeah and your connection what what is your connection to Drake um we met when we were really young uh 13 he was 14 he wow. was on Degrassi and I had mm-hmm. like one song unpredictable was out the music video was out we met and he became my first like real industry friend but like real friend and um and he was getting into music at that time too not or yet not, not no. yet right he, he was, was just still acting. just acting yeah. yeah and um no we just bonded because you know we were both only children biracial ties to the u.s you know local celebrities 
he couldn't go places, I couldn't go places, and it was isolating for him, it was isolating for me. So we just had each other, really. And um, oftentimes, we would just sit there and, and plot and scheme just plot and scheme, like, how do we get into a meeting with so-and-so? Well, if you get into a meeting with so-and-so, can you tell them about me? Yeah, you tell me. Like, that was literally all we used to do. Yeah. Um, and just- You were dreaming together. Daydream, like the sun would come up and we would have been talking for like eight hours about our plotting and scheming and what wow. we imagined for our lives. And um, he just always was my support system. Like he would come to a show and if something, you know, didn't go right, he would, be like, it's okay, you're dope. Or he was the one that made me want to sing more in my falsetto. I didn't know my falsetto was so great. He was the one that was like, you need to really get into that. Or certain songs, like he'd leave my crib blasting my music in the car and he got close to my mom. So then, you know, that was really a cute relationship. Um, and he understood music, obviously. Oh, if he's telling you to sing in your falsetto. You know, it's funny because he is one of the best writers period that I know and even then before he was making music you can't ask the man how are you without getting the wittiest response ever like he's just a witty person I have like letters he's written me that were just witty as shit like he's just that guy he's right. always been that guy he's always been good at English Scrabble King like beat your ass in Scrabble every single wow. day of the week eyes closed like he's just always that guy so I always imagined him in that space and he was so talented and he has such a good ear for music. So when he did get into music, it was so fun for me. Like it was an exciting time. <laughs> it was exciting, you know, it was like, yes, come on. You know, it was, it was so, it was so dope. And just his wordplay, it just always made sense uh, for me. So yeah, we just share that like special bond and um, it's just so nice to see him be successful. And did you grow up together? Because you've yeah. known each other since you were 14. Yeah, like, we grew up together and um, it's just been fun watching him succeed. It's, it's like, uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And I, it's, he's one of those people that it doesn't matter what he does. It doesn't matter where I see him, if we're at the same party, if we're talking, if I see him on television, I always know what he's thinking. Yeah. <laughs> I always know. It doesn't matter. Like anything could happen and I'm like, Okay, man. Like, I just can't help it, you know? <laughs> yeah. But I'm, like, protective of him, too, you know? Because he was so protective of me. And he is, still to this day, is very protective of me. But I feel like, yeah, there's that kind of kinship. Yeah. Well, you've known each other since you were so young. Yeah. And, you know, when you come up with someone like that, that's something that is such a special bond. No one can ever take that away from Never. you. Or understand it, either. Never you know? understand so it, yeah. I, I, I get that. I get that. It's like, you know, people I went to theater school with... We've both moved to LA and kind of come up together. Like there's, you know, you see the trials and tribulations and how hard the other person had to work to get to where they are. Yes. And, and you've seen them, like you said, dreaming and then living the and reality. manifesting at a high and level. you're like, holy crap, you did it. Like you, you did, did it. it. It's, you did it's it. insane. It's insane. insane. And it's nice to... And the level to which he did it at. I mean, oh, it's, yeah. that's next level. And that's the work level. that he put in, it was it's beautiful mm -hmm. to watch. But I will say that... Um, it's nice to see it's nice to see him succeed. It's nice to have been around in like certain areas, but the best part about it is at that time I didn't have anyone I could trust. And it's nice to have someone that you, you know loves you genuinely for you and it's not none of this. Yeah. You it's know? not about that. And yeah. vice versa, yeah. I know he feels that way. It's nice to know that like you know, I I loved you before all of this. And yes. and that's like that's me. It's in, this, in the world that we live in, it's so val. Like to me, it means the world to me to know that there's someone that's like you. You know me for real. You yeah, know? that's yeah. so sweet. Yeah. All right. So you're you're 21 and you start hosting. Yeah. Is there a pivotal moment where you go? That's it for music for me. Now, I know it'll always be a part of your life because yeah. I understand that you're an artist and, and it's always going to be a part of who you are. But is there a moment where you go, you know what, I'm going to focus on this instead of music? It got like 106 in Park got so crazy, uh, obviously being a daily show five days a week. You know, everybody like it's the, a beast. What? You have Michelle Obama. You have Robert De Niro. You have Jason Statham, Mariah Carey. Like every day was just like, who do we have today? It was so crazy. And also, you know, I was still with the hockey player. I was with Ray. So, it, you know, that's a whole other component. I was like head of the 
the WAGS Foundation, the charity group. So I was like putting on charity events. Like I was doing everything. Okay, wow. it was a lot. It was busy. Yeah. Um, but music did take a step to the side. Also, the music industry was shifting so much, and key players were moving on, and it was just not. Be- it wasn't the same for me. I came up when it was retail artist development they put you in media training right like it was just a whole different beast and then it became like oh we're gonna sell your songs on itunes for 99 cents like girl what (laughs) like i remember even then thinking like this is not good this is not good for anyone 99 cents how do you decide a song is 99 cents and what is that going to say when inflation kicks in 20 years from now and look where we are now we're still arguing about streaming services now universal don't got music on tiktok like we're still that set that was the lack of yeah. foresight yeah. from the industry back then. Well, now it's like we just, you know, we just had heard that it's like now it's like every 150 streams is like selling one song. Like it's 150 plays. Baby, it's it is ghetto outside. <laughs> okay. It is ghetto. Okay. Period. It's ghetto out there. Listen, what I do, I actually write, I still write music. Okay. I ghost write as wow. well. Wow. All right. Yeah. You know, got she got a little. <laughs> so you're still doing it. Yeah, still man, it. play with me, okay? Yeah. I be writing. I be ghostwriting like hip hop records. Mm. I written some gang shit before. You'd be like, <laughs> what you know about that? No, but I do a little bit, okay? <laughs> I do know. I I've lived you. a life. I've lived a life. I believe. Um, no, but I'm still very much in music. I, I definitely. Um, I still offer. You know, I, I write for people. I A and R for people. I connect certain things. Um, Will you ever come back and and? For come, myself, for yourself, come back and release a single or an album or anything. Well, why, why, you know, wildly enough, my first album is hitting its twentieth anniversary oh. in June. Ooh, okay, oh. June. Oh, oh. So, all twenty right. years is nuts. Yeah, it is. So, Especially because you're twenty one. So it's uh, I know it's insane. <laughs> out of the womb, she came out with being gone. <laughs> twenty. It's crazy. That's nuts. That's what? Wild. I don't even like. Congratulations. I don't. Thank you. I don't like how it sounds. I want no parts of it, but we have to do it for no, the people. It just means you've been doing this <laughs> for a long time. Yeah. You know, and since you've been, you know, since you were so young. Too. So young. Thank the Lord it was when I was young. Because yeah. you imagine 20, I, I don't know, one day, oh Lord, let's not even talk about it. The point is, <laughs> it's coming out in June and um, I have been, you know, thinking about music and, and what I want to say and uh, yeah. Okay. It's never over. All right. It's never over. Yeah, as an artist, it's never over. I'll mention that. But I think you dropped a little thing right there. So I don't know. I'll get at that, but I I don't know. know. I I don't know. know. Can that Mm. be the start of this podcast episode? I'm looking at you. It's your show. (laughs) (laughs) I'm (laughs) looking in your eyes, and that that meant something. It meant something. There's definitely something there. (laughs) All right. Can we zoom in, Randy? Um, He can do it in post, Alex. He can do it in post. You don't know how this shit works, man. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> One thing I want to talk about is your your creative in all expressions. So you, you know, music from being a host to launching your own hair yeah. uh, company and your mm-hmm. own called Care. Yeah. Um, and I don't know about you, but like during the pandemic, but like I was like probably like sitting on the couch and, and doing jack shit. And you're launching this like incredible business. Thanks. <laughs> like, that's, that's I was amazing. bored. Well, the thing is, you know, what's funny is all my best ideas come from boredom. Yeah. And I try to tell people, make yourself as bored as possible. Oh. Nobody likes to be bored. Everybody wants to be on their phone. They're immediately like, oh, let me go to Instagram. Let me go to TikTok, which I do have designated time for these things. But sometimes it's really nice to be bored. Even like they call it bed rotting. Yeah. You don't leave the bed. Mm-hmm. You, you do might, that. Yeah. I mean, I've str- be honest with you, I've actually struggled with depression multiple times throughout my life. And... I've conquered it. The first time I conquered it, what, I mean, when I first experienced depression, I literally thought it was the end of life. But once I conquered it, now when I go through depressive episodes, I'm like, you're going to come out of it. So just sit in it and see how you can get out of it. You know, I just right. let it happen. But that's what kind of got me into staying in bed. Because as you guys know, I'm a go-go every single day in a different city, moving around, yeah. red-eye flights, all kinds of crazy stuff. And just to sit and be bored... I'm like, hmm, I should do this. And then next thing you know, I have a whole new thing I'm doing. So right. I try to embrace the lows too. Um, but no, I started care because my hair has gone through so much being on sets of shows. Yeah. They have no idea what to do with my hair. 
So I'd have to show up blow dried, blown out like this, so it would be easy to do. But my hair in its natural state, they would it was a struggle. It was a struggle. And I would go home crying all the time. So my mom always used to make like oils and mix things. Mm -hmm. But during the pandemic, I'm like, Mom, what did you do? What mask did you make? How do I make this work? Maybe I, this is a good time to have my hair get repaired, like just do masks the whole time. I mean, the world was in a crisis. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I was thinking about skincare and do I have enough Lysol? And maybe I should get ring lights because the boys are going to FaceTime me. It's it's a real thing being <laughs> on set as an African. Like, they, Yo. I, I relaxed, they had relaxed my hair for Aladdin. So I had to go in for a couple of treatments. I say relax, like, to get it straight, right? Not to curl it up. I no, know some people do relax No, you curl get, up I know relaxer for straight. Yeah. I heard that. So they did that a couple of times because, and then we would still on top of that, blow dry and straighten my hair like mm. every day sometimes i would not wash my hair for a couple of days just to like let it last because i didn't want that much heat Ugh. but it was a lot on my hair i had to chemically straighten it like twice for aladdin so oh my god it's uh sometimes they're just don't know what to do with it yeah and like my hair being long has been my signature and so this is all your yeah your hair. all my hair and wow. um thank you thank Thanks. Wow. But I would be on set and Alex, I would come you don't home. know about this, okay? But I got okay. two sisters and usually that would be like extensions and like, you <laughs> no, don't even know. No, the fact that I that's know. all her hair is Thank amazing. you. It's Thank amazing. you. I literally would come home and cry because I'd see like my ends and I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to have to get cut it off again. Like Dead I used ends. to freak out. So that's why I was doing a lot of oiling treatments and that's how care started basically. Um, I called a bunch of chemists and was like, hey, these are my favorite products. Can you break down the ingredients? And once we like reverse engineered products that I already to use I was mortified seeing what was actually in those products and what ingredients they were using and then I started to like make calls sourcing the raw materials around the world where are you getting it from hey do you have like the original you're saying it's vegan but like can you show me the documentation suddenly they go missing and I'm oh, like oh wow. okay good to know so it was a lot of that I had a lot of time to do the research, I didn't think it was gonna turn into a hair oil or turn into a brand. It was me just genuinely curious. And um, then I got obsessed with formulating. Full-fledged nerd, I'm not gonna lie to y'all. You're I got now. I got scales, beakers, had a whole lab created Breaking PPE. Bad kind of shit, eh? oh, wow. I was playing J. Cole, the neighbors think I'm selling dope. <laughs> and I was over there cooking my hair oil like, hey, I thought I was doing something. And then I was like making it and sending it to my friends and stuff. And then it became like, I ran out. Can you make me more? And then I was like, oh, oh you like it? They're like, yeah. And then and then that's how it evolved. It took about a year and a half and like 21 revisions wow. before I was like the way it absorbs, the way it, and everybody that's used it's loved it. And then I thought, okay, I'm gonna like put it out. So what is it, it's what what line do you have or what products? Is it just yeah. the hair oil? What do you have? Yeah, so right now it's the hair oil. Um, I have extra rich and soft for different types of hair, um, but they and, just keep selling out. And you put it in and you let it sit and then wash Whatever it off want. after a couple hours? Can you sleep with it overnight? What you do can you do? sleep with it overnight. You can just put it in, wash it off. If you know you're going to wash your hair that day, you can like put it in, put your hair in a bun, go to work, come home, wash it out. Okay. Or you can use it to like blow dry it when you're styling it. Okay. Or if you have frizz, okay. any type of damage. It's a multi-purpose. So it's very versatile. Yes, that was the goal. I'm like, I cannot... Just not. I need to make sure it, it can be used for multiple things. Okay. But it was really, honestly, selfishly, just for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I just go. I just want something that I can. But I needed the chemist to like co-sign it, and I wanted to learn how to make it because I don't trust these brands. So yeah, I yeah. get it. I the other day I shaved my head for my last movie, um, and so I was like, I got my hair to grow back as quickly as possible. Oh. So I was googling stuff, and I was like castor oil with peppermint, and then I was yes. like Jamaican castor oil, and I went down a rabbit hole. But then you're right. You, you then I started seeing like, you know, because you read the good and bad, and then mm -hmm. it was like, no, it's too thick, it clogs up your pores, so you got to yeah. wash it out because if you leave it in too long, it won't grow properly. There's so much. And info. then you're just like, oh fuck it, I'm not doing anything. I'm just <laughs> yeah. gonna leave this shit alone. <laughs> so I totally get yes. that. It's a thing. It's, it's a, a thing. thing. That's why I ended up hiring the chemist because I was like, can you explain this to me? And then. I mean, we we're just sitting on Zoom. Nothing to do. We we're in a pandemic. So, yeah, who is this chemist? There's three of them. There's three? Yeah, one of them, he, I love him so much. He just, I would just ask him the randomest questions and he would be like, give me an hour to put together a presentation. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, we're not doing anything. So, I'll see you in an hour. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'll be right here. I'll yeah. be here. 
Okay, no. so, so I want to switch gears here for a second. Talk. Let's yeah. talk about hosting. Yes. And the the transition of being um, being in the spotlight to you are still in the spotlight as a host, but it's more of the person, the subject matter that you're interviewing. Yeah. What was that experience in being the person who's doing kind of what Mina and I are doing right now? Yeah. On a daily basis. Well, it's totally an art form. I. Um, Definitely studied like the Oprahs of the world in that style of interview, the sensational interview, getting down into like the thick of things. Listening is a superpower, but I realized in interviewing it's so much fun. It's really therapy and interrogation. It's a beautiful blend. Like I love it. I don't know how to explain it. I just love it. And because I've been interviewed for so many years, I understand the art of that conversation. But also I could tell in it with interviewers when they're thinking of the next question or when they're not prepared or when they're nervous and how oftentimes it turns on my media training. Right. Like as soon as I see those certain symbols, I'm like, okay, we're back into media training. And it takes a lot to like sit in it and be grounded and be your authentic self. So my joy and my challenge in those interviews is like, how do I get the rawest, most authentic version of this very guarded person. Like that is, it's so much fun. I really enjoy it. Were you ever resistant to it feeling like, well, this isn't me, I'm Oh, a hell musician. yeah. I was like, I'm motherfucking, at the time, yeah. I was like, I'm motherfucking Keisha Shante. I'm not interviewing none of these hoes. Hell <laughs> no. Nah. That's what I used to, I'm an artist. I make music, interview me. That's literally what happened. That's, yeah. I'm not going to lie. And then I had to check my ego because I'm like, okay, if <laughs> I'm doing you know, that first episode of 106 of Park with Terrence J, just for fun, it was such an opportunity. But the way I was received and how, you know, the audience was so happy and the company was so happy, I'm like, well, maybe I can do something like this. Maybe it would be really fun to just try it out. And I checked myself, really. Yeah. And now I'm at a point where a lot of my interviews aren't, it doesn't feel like me interviewing them. There's a there's a French just friendships there. Hundred percent from my own music career as well from all the years of working. Um, I think the best interviews are the ones where you end up interviewing each other. And what I mean by that, it just becomes like two friends having conversations. Yes, because that's what you do with your friends anyway. You know, friend you haven't seen in a while. You're catching up. You're learning about each other. Those are the best interviews. Yes. And, you know, we talk about that, too. Sometimes it gets very, like, I ask you a question, you answer. And I'm like, that <laughs> shit is not, nobody wants oh, to see that a, shit. A, B, A, B. Like, yeah. hang me. I hate it. <laughs> uh, I hate it. But some of the people I've interviewed, there's been so many, like, it's so fun to, you know, meet those people and, and have those conversations and ask the questions you don't want, you know, they don't want asked. Like, I'm going to always go there. And, um, you know, they're grown. You can say no. Yeah. Next question. Not yeah. gonna answer. But I'm still gonna ask. Yeah. There's an there's an art it's an art form. You gotta respect the craft. So um no, I really enjoyed it. I've had so many wild experiences. There's there's a lesson to be had out of this because, you know, I think that because when you're not resistant to something, when you let life kind of just come to you, yeah. there's beautiful things that can happen. I think sometimes yeah. we're so resistant to it. It's happened to me as well where, you know, I'm like, I'm an actor and I'm a, I'm a movie actor too. So I'm not doing this other stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes when you're resistant to life, it just hits you over the head and you're missing out on a lot of opportunities, yes. you know, and things that you're great at things that'll bring you great gifts in your life, things that will evolve your life. You never know who you can meet mm -hmm. or what can come out of certain things. And it's hard. Yeah. So I commend you on like being open and opening Thank up you. because it opened up this incredible chapter of your life. Oh my gosh. That you otherwise you could have pushed away. You could have shut down. Yeah. And it's such a different, uh, it's still the same. It's still entertainment. I'm still performing. It's still part of the craft. I'm writing things in different ways, you know, mm -hmm. writing stories, producing shows. It's it's a different way. I'm not maybe not producing music every single day, but I'm producing TV. It's, so I'm still working. I'm just a worker bee. Like I have to be productive. I have entrepreneurial spirit. I have to be putting out my creative ideas or I am bored. I literally will get instantly depressed. Yeah. Genuinely like I remember one time my mom, I'm like, I'm depressed. My mom was like, you are on vacation. Like, just enjoy. Yeah. I can't. Yeah. I can't. I, like, need to feel productive. I feel like time is so short. And I really want to maximize the shit out of this life. Like, I don't want to be a certain age one day looking back like, man, I did I really, 
you know, do everything that I wanted to do. And every single day I wake up and I'm like, what could I do today? Yeah. Yeah. Good for you. Good yeah. for Thanks. you. I mean, it just reminds me, <laughs> and not to get too deep here, but I remember speaking to my therapist too about this. And there's different types of therapy, right? There's like people who need to like sit down, they need to like relax, they need to slow down. But they also said there's people who actually like yourself and kind of like mean it to a certain degree who just need to keep going. And that's a form of therapy of just yes. doing, getting your reps in. And that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. As long like it's not like you're out there like doing drugs or doing this like you're yeah, just, exactly. you just want to do something that fulfills you that uh, that feeds your soul. Yeah, yeah right? and I do think sometimes like cuz my fiance we go out, we go to vacation and she's the same. She gets angry at me because after a few days I'm kind of like, "All right, I'm ready to like start working again." Like yeah. this was nice and she's like, "Just sit in it. Just relax." So I do think sometimes with our personalities, sometimes actually sitting in doing nothing like you said you yeah. said you know sitting in the state of boredom is actually good for your soul because it does teach you about yourself oh and, yes. and you start to question like well why am i like that like why can i not sit still so there's there's something there too yeah um as we as we wrap this up i i think something so valuable that listeners can get out of this and out of your experience is looking back if you were to look back at your life and, you know, working as a musician since yeah. you were 13 and then transitioning into something else when you were 21 and, and you know, you know, dating this man who, you know, that was an interesting life as well, an interesting phase of your life. It seems like you grew up fast. Yes, I you did. You grew up very fast. I did. And I think if it's fair to say, you also entered stages of your life probably sooner than a lot of people and did. some and some stages late yeah and, some and the late bloomer like exactly I'm, it's literally backwards and everything it's nuts but yes if there were if there was one lesson you you took out of that that you think could help people inspire people mm. what what do you think that is and we talked a lot of, about a yeah. lot of different lessons but i would say if i could if i were to go back i would have taken more risks in the moment Everything is scary. Everything new is scary. The idea of moving to another city, taking a new job, all of that is so scary and can be very overwhelming. Um, but looking back, I'm like, gosh, you should take more risks because what ends up happening is you always survive. You always make it. It always works out some way. If you can just sit in the discomfort and know that like, I've overcome this before. I think a lot of people's sadness and... Um, just feelings and fears come from not seeing a solution to the problem in their mind. Mm -hmm. They can't immediately envision the solution. Spend more time thinking of how it could go right than how it could go wrong. I would have just taken more risks. I would have moved to New York sooner. I would have went for things a lot faster. I wouldn't have been as shy, as timid. Um, I would have really went for it. Yeah. Yeah. And do you feel like you're doing that now more in life? Yeah. I think now I'm just more open to having conversations about things that I'm like, do you, you know, someone wants me to get into entertainment law. I love entertainment law. Sometimes I'm like, am I going to do that? And then I, now I'm just open to the conversation or producing different shows that I didn't think I would be doing. Um, yeah. Just take the risks. I think um, engagement is currency. And we see that a lot in this world right now. We see that a lot with social media. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, sometimes we spend time thinking, are we liked? And did I, did I say the wrong thing? Did I do the wrong thing? Just stick to your morals. But ultimately, engagement is currency. If people even have something to say, you're winning, right. good or bad. And um, if that allows you the freedom to be like, I'm just going to be authentically myself. People are so scared to be themselves. Yeah. I, damn, I am. Yeah. It's, are you? Yeah. No. Oh, yeah, yeah. For y sure. You could not, only. Not, not every day, but, you know, there's, you get bogged down by the, I don't want to get canceled. I don't want this person to think that of me. I don't want my future employers to think I'm difficult. I don't mm. want this. I don't want that. It's also so code switching, too, and, like. Yeah. Oh, kind of I code switch like a motherfucker. You could see it in this interview. I code <laughs> switch every day of my life. Yeah. Yo, but <laughs> but it's still part of who you are. Yeah. It's part of who I am. It's a balancing you know? act. It's yeah. a balancing act. Yeah, but I think you could only be as honest with people as you are with yourself, and that's why I swear by self help, um, introspection, therapy. I spend a lot of time like dissecting myself so that there's nothing anyone can ask me that will throw me off. You know, I try to make put myself in a position where no one can trigger me. 
And I've been through a lot of things from like grief to mental health struggles to, you know, everything you can think of, honestly, uh, domestic violence. Like I've been through a lot of things. And obviously when you're, you've experienced those things, they're triggers and you can put a wall up, but I found a way to be my authentic self and really not give a damn. Yeah. It took me a while to get here, but now I don't give a damn. And now that I feel that liberated feeling, I want everyone to feel that feeling. Like. Yeah. Be yourself. And if people don't like it, they're still reacting to it. You won, period. You know, go out there in the world and like maximize the shit out of this life because you literally don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So don't let things bog you down. It's all circumstance. There is a solution to every problem, even the worst ones. Um, and just go for it. Like, fuck it. Who cares? <laughs> I think wow. that's it. That I think is that's the it. Best way that's to end this yeah, episode. I love it. I love it. Keisha, oh. honestly, you I didn't know what to expect because it's her first time sitting down <laughs> yeah. and talking, but um you've tremendously impressed me oh, with thanks. how articulate Thank you, so you are. <laughs> thanks, guys. How beautiful you are inside Thank and you. out. Thank you. you. It was, you are a, uh, an amazing human being. Thank so, you. Thank you for taking the time to sit down with us. I hope people, and I know people, will get something out of this. And thank you for what you've done for R&B, for Toronto. For Canada. For, for Canada, you. for people right here, right now, listening to this. Like, this, this has been amazing. And I know thank that you. whatever you do in your next chapter, whether it's continuing to host or maybe a 20th anniversary surprise Wink. or uh, whatever it is, you're going to blow people away because you're you. just authentically yourself. Thank you. It's been amazing. Oh, well, you guys are amazing. <laughs> oh, we thanks, told the Keisha. truth. <laughs> yeah. And I hope that people grow. Y'all grow, okay? <laughs> there you go. Grow you and told, baby. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for tuning in and listening. Please subscribe, share, and join the journey of Growth Untold. Don't miss a single nugget. Hit that follow button now on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and Instagram. 